Hey everyone. <clears throat> so, I guess first off, let's go. Who am I? What do I do? So, I'm Jesse Brizzy. I'm a research engineer at a startup called Curalate. Basically, it means I'm a, com a computer vision machine learning engineer at the company. My main background is in computer science, but I do a lot of focus on computer vision and machine learning. Machine learning. Uh, what does the company do that's relevant to machine learning? So we are an e-commerce SaaS company. Basically, the one sentence blurb is our platform enables brands to find image by find image-based social media content and repurpose it for e-commerce purposes. Specifically, I'm on the image intelligence team, which owns the entire pipeline of researching new machine learning ideas for applications, developing it, training it, researching it, and then getting out it, it out in, into production. We're a pretty small startup, so we're pretty scrappy at it. One good example of a product that we do with machine learning is our intelligent product tagging software. So basically, it's a it's technology that analyzes imagery and uses machine learning to identify specific products depicted within that image from our client's brand catalog. So this next slide, I have a just kind of video demonstration of it if you want to go through it. So as you can see, we have the image on the right. We identify the objects in the image, and we match those specific objects with products from the client catalog that we have previously ingested and run through our system to identify with. It's a pretty interesting problem. It's pretty fun to work at. This isn't the only thing we do ML on. We do a couple of other things, but I'm not here to sell my company. I'm here to help you figure out what kind of deep learning library you want to use. So working at Curalite and doing all this machine learning stuff for a while, I've had the unfortunate experience of working my way through a few of these to kind of figure out which one we wanted to use and which one we wanted to commit to. We've used a couple for a year, real, like years, realized it was just a pain to maintain and use in our production stack and to kind of do research and train with. So we, I think two years ago or like one year and a half ago, we went on a kind of paper review of the current state of deep learning libraries and kind of figured out what we wanted to commit to. And along the way, we kind of learned a lot of things about what we should really be looking out for and like what's important in a deep learning library and kind of the quality of life things you want to deal with day to day in terms of your, I guess, entire work pipeline. So hopefully this talk can give you some insight of what we learned and will help you make the similar decision yourself if that's something you're looking to do. And you may find out that more than one of these might actually work well for you. So just kind of a good introduction for the people who are like completely new here, just so we're not completely lost with acronyms. Uh, what is a neural network? So, a bas so basically, a neural network or artificial neural network is a machine learning model that is modeled after biological neural networks. Basically, think of the brain, where on the right, you can see it's abstracted out to basically a series of nested functions where each individual node or neuron inside the network does a simple task. And when they're all collected together in layers, you have your input on the left, output on the right. It can learn to do a task. Mathematically, they're just structured as nested functions with weights, and the, those weights are trained via backpropagation. They can be as simple as this network here with only one hidden layer, which the hidden layer is the layer on the inside, the exposed layers are the input and the output, or they can be as crazy deep with like hundreds of layers and millions of parameters that you all need to train. So, some acronyms that you're going to see when people are talking about neural networks. So you have your FCNs, or your fully connected neural networks. So these are kind of your basic multi-layer perceptrons. So you have your network with multiple layers in it, where all the nodes inside the layers are connected to all the previous nodes in the previous layer. Well, when you start adding layers to this and start getting deeper and deeper and deeper to kind of get more, predict more predictive power out of your model, the weights can start to add up and kind of get unruly, which is where the next type of model comes in, CNNs, or convolutional neural networks, especially when it comes to the area of computer vision, since images can be fairly large inputs if you think of each individual pixel as an input to your, to your network, where instead of having a fully connected layer, each layer are contained of convolutional layers, where each convolutional kernel or filter is a collection of weights that's convolved over each layer, whether that be your input or the hidden layers on the inside, where all the weights are shared between, the, between all the kernels. So you can think of it as, say you have a neural network that's good at identifying cars. You may have a kernel that's good at identifying wheels, and it'll 
convolve over the entire input uh, space of your image to help find those wheels, and then the layer layers will do some more s deeper semantic knowledge with that information that it was able to I identify. You have your RNNs, which are recurrent neural networks. These are neural networks that feed back into themselves. So they're really useful for temporal problems, mainly used in natural language processing tasks. Um, they're kind of basic, but they can be used for other temporal things like stock data or like just basically any time series that you need to predict on. Um, then you have your LSTMs, which are basically fancy neural networks. They're, I mean, fancy RNNs. They're long, short-term memory recurrent neural nets. Basically, think of it like a recurrent neural net that is able to determine what is important and not important to remember. There are gates on the inside that it can decide what information that it gleaned at this certain time stop in your temporal data for it to remember for the next iterations as it goes on through, whether it be your text sequence or your stock data that's flowing in or whatever your time series data is. So now that that's out of the way, let's go over the important factors that everyone should be really looking for when they're selecting a library to work with. And probably the biggest thing that you need to look for in the beginning is who is the library kind of targeted at? So you have your academia, focused libraries, and then you have like your industry focused libraries. Depending on who you are, they're going to offer certain features or kind of a certain quality of working with it that will be better for you. Uh, the community support, this is honestly a big thing. So how e easy is, is it to find pre-trained models for whatever task you're trying to do? So say you're trying to do something as simple as like spam filtering or do semantic tagging or just classification on images. There are a lot of pre-trained networks that people might produce publicly that are already done for this. So if you have a very popular library that you're using, there's probably going to be a higher chance of these people creating the models for you. And you can just download that and go along your way. And you don't actually have to do any training or anything. Um, how often are research papers reproduced in your library of choice in an open source manner? So for like a lot of the kind of new and great research that comes out of conferences, there are going to be open source implementations of those research papers available on GitHub or Bitbucket or whatever you want to use for your source management. And basically, if you want to use like this new layer or this new model structure, if someone's already gone through the trouble of making an open source equivalent for you, it's pretty simple. Then you can just kind of pull down that model and then go training right away with your own data if you want to repurpose it for your own domain-specific task. And of course, how Googleable are like the bugs you're going to be running into. So if you run into an issue, which you will run into an issue working with these, especially if you're trying to get into a production environment, how common is it going to be that someone else has already run into your problem that's going to give you a solution on something like Stack Overflow or something? There's going to be the development barriers to getting into it. So how good is the documentation? How low level or high level is the library? Is it going to have you doing a lot of needless like boilerplate and like magic number work when you're trying to get your network together? Or is it just kind of like a three line thing to get your network training and running? How many supported programming languages? And especially if it supports the language of your choice for doing your training or research or getting into your production environment. And the ability to scale, which is going to be more on the production side of things. But if you want to be able to scale it up to a massive cluster of GPUs, how well does it do that? Can it even do that in the first place? And how performant is it? The code base quality. So you want to use a library that is actively maintained. You don't want to be like file a bug and it never get addressed for a year because there's no one actually there working on it. So the more actively maintained it is, the better. And performance. Here's an oldest benchmark. I'll go over it more in detail later on. But basically, you want to have good performance for whether you're working on GPUs, multiple GPUs, if you're working specifically on CPUs, or even down to mobile platforms. And each library offers a very kind of different performance that you can expect, especially for the type of neural network and task that you're trying to do. So that's a key thing to be, pay attention to. So the last thing to really main, to think about is the train to production pipeline that you're going to be looking at. So say you want to have a library that can support a faster prototype language that you use for like research and testing things out, so like Python and R. But your deployment uh, language that you have for your production environment is something like a JVM language like Java or Scala or C++ or JavaScript if you're trying to throw it up on the web or something. So ideally, you can train it locally on your hardware and then push it out to your production environment just very simply, even though it's a completely different environment, or even onto cloud services if it's already integrated and set up for it. 
And you want to be able to run it locally and on mobile phones, massive server farms. And also, ideally, have the ability to take your work to other libraries. So say you get tired of your library and you want to leave it one day, hopefully you can transfer it out and into the new library and they offer or support at least that kind of functionality. So one main thing you have to look out for with your neural net library choice is the difference between the imperative and symbolic kind of paradigms for defining the nets. Um, they each have their own disadvantage and advantage. So to start off, dynamic paradigm for defining computation graphs or your networks is basically, you can think of it just kind of as most standard programming languages work. Basically, as the library goes through your code, kind of like on the right, you can see here some example NumPy code, it basically computes it as it sees it. The advantage of this is that it makes prototyping and debugging very easy. So you can stick random like debug statements, print statements inside your model definition if it's in a dynamic paradigm. Um, it's very useful when your graph structure needs to change while it's running. So some networks based on the input will change the structure of the network itself for whatever the output is. It tends to be a lot more flexible. Um, it's easier to use native language features. So if you like for loops in Python, or if you're like doing any like list comprehension stuff in your fancier languages, and the graph of your network can just kind of follow the logical flow of your program that you're writing out for it. Now on the other side is you have your symbolic paradigms, which kind of addresses some of the negatives with a dynamic paradigm. So when you have a dynamically defined graph with your library, it can't do a lot of optimizations that will help in terms of speed, which might be very important for your production environment. So with symbolic paradigm is you define everything about your graph before it's ran. So on the right, you can see the, the equivalent NumPy code where you will define your entire computation and then you will compile it and then call the function itself and you'll replace the variables with whatever your input data is. Now the advantage of this is that it allows the library to optimize your nets for you to do things like reuse memory. If it sees that, oh, in the earlier stages of this network, we use this one memory position, but later on it's dumped and never referenced again, so we can just reuse it in place, especially if memory is a, require, is a constrained resource on your system. Whereas in the dynamic paradigm, when it sees you use a variable, it doesn't know if you're ever going to need it again, so it has to keep it around the entire time until you manually dump it yourself. And it's a lot easier for handling the network itself. So especially in a production environment, when you need to load in your net and unload your net and kind of move it around with things, especially if you're worried about your resources that you have to deal with, knowing exactly when you compile and initiate the network, when it will take up the resources and every single time it will always take the same amount of memory is a kind of nice thing to have. And like I said, it can optimize the graph and start and is generally good for feed forward fixed nets. So your feed forward fully connected neural nets and your CNNs, whereas the dynamic paradigm is useful for LSTMs and your RNNs because they kind of change as it goes along. So first thing I'm going to go over is generally the libraries that you pe most people should know about. And if you're making a decision, these are the libraries that you'll probably select from. So getting started, IMO, one of the first mainstream production ready libraries is CAFE. Um, on the right, I will have these kind of useful charts here. Basically, I will share the slides at the end of the day and they have useful links that you can go out and click yourself if you're more interested and curious to learn more. But basically it has things like the GitHub uh, current stats for watches, stars and forks, how long basically average issues are resolved and how many open issues there are to kind of get an idea of like how maintained the code base is, the type of paradigm that the API interface uses. Up at top we'll have a bunch of icons for what APIs are available language-wise. For example, for CAFE, we have Python, C++, and MATLAB. And we'll have links up to the model zoo if you want to see what models are pre-trained and available for you to work with. And also just a number of research citations on the right if you want to kind of get an idea of how actively used these libraries are in the research community. So back to CAFE. So CAFE is one of the early and my, like, and then like I said, one of the first mainstream product-ready libraries out there. It's very high performant and has a very well-tested C++ code base. It was one of the first and kind of started the concept of a model zoo where people publicly put up their models to share with other people if they wanted to reuse it for other purposes. For 
that it has a pretty large community of open source research projects, given that it was so early. A lot of people latched onto it. You're not going to see numbers that high for research citations for any of the other libraries. Some are catching up, though. Um, it's very good for feed-forward for feed neural networks and like image processing. It was originally designed to do work with CNNs. You can actually get going without writing any code at all. Um, they provide a pretty verbose but useful kind of like config interface where you just kind of define some con con config files, put your data in a certain format and a folder, run a binary, and along you go. It's training the code for you without ever writing a single line of Python or something. Its main advantage was that it was kind of the first to market. So everybody kind of latched onto it, started doing research, and the people started doing research based off that research and kind of kept expanding to its own network effect. And it, most libraries are capable of converting from CAFE into themselves because they all recognize that this is a lot where a lot of people are coming from. So if we want to attract more people over, we have to support CAFE as an incoming source. Now, it's not all that. Like, like all great things. So it has some bad design choices that are inherited just because from its original use case, which was specifically convolutional neural networks, and it was also first to market. So it made a lot of mistakes that people learned to not do later on. It's not really that great for recurrent neural networks. It can do it, but it's kind of like a hacked on afterthought, and it's kind of clunky to work with. It does not support auto differentiation, which is a big thing. So whenever you define your network, you also have to manually do the math and define the gradients and do all the calculus for the back pass over your network for training, which can be a little annoying. Um, and as for finding new layers, it can be very verbose and kind of annoying, because you have to actually go down into the raw C++ in CUDA to define new layers in CAFE if you want to add them in. Now, it is possible to do it in Python, but then it backs out of the C++ library and slows everything down to the point where it's not really that great to use. And the graph itself are just kind of treated as a collection of layers, not necessarily like the individual nodes. And the, basically, each layer does a common set of math functionality that you can just reuse and reuse and reuse to create your entire graph. But like I said, it's a bit of a pain to write new layers for. One of the other important libraries that I need to introduce before we get to the other ones is Keras. So Keras is not a deep learning library on its own. It is a library that sits on top of other deep learning libraries and provides a single, easy to use, high level interface. It's very modular, minimal, readable, uh, object oriented code, and it's great for beginners with great documentation. So basically, if you're trying to get it started as fast as possible and you don't really care how things work on, on the inside, just go with Keras and you'll be pretty happy. It lacks in its optimizations since it's basically built on top of other deep learning libraries, so it can't actually create a graph structure that is efficient because it has to be ad adaptable to all of them. It has supported backends mainly for TensorFlow and Theano. It also supports CNTK, and there's a branch that supports MXNet. I'll get to all of these later on in their own right. The nice thing about Keras is that after you define and train your model in this simple interface, you can actually export your model in whatever underlying backend format you used. So say you use the simple Keras interface to define your neural net, you trained it and everything, you can actually just export a TensorFlow model out and then load that back into whatever TensorFlow environment you're working with. In fact, because of this, TensorFlow actually includes a fork of Keras inside their own library to use if you're using the Python API. Keras itself is only Python and actually it's also R. I forgot to add in the R logo up top. One issue is that, like I said, it's not a, you can't optimize as much. It's not as customizable. And sometimes when you're doing more advanced things with neural networks, you'll have to drop down into the underlying library to do some things. And it gets a little weird when you do that because you're mixing, like, for example, raw TensorFlow code with Keras code. And it's kind of, like I said, weird. So probably the one that most people already know about is TensorFlow. It is by far the most popular option out there for doing deep learning. It, it has the largest active community. And probably more open source projects use TensorFlow than anything else. It has support for all these languages up here. So Python, R, C++, Go, JavaScript, C Sharp, Java, and Rust. I, on the right here, I will also have um, some links out to code examples. Basically, all these links out to a uh, fairly helpful GitHub repo where uh, they've collected together a list of 
common tasks all done in each library. So you can compare and contrast how simple it is and how different it is to do, for example, CNN um, tra training and uh, classification in all these libraries to maybe help your decision process. Um, basically, TensorFlow is Google's attempt of basically solving everything that they can in the deep learning kind of environment. They have built it with massive distributed computing in mind. Basically, it powers all of the Google apps out there. It powers YouTube, it powers Google Maps, Google Translate, the Assistant. Um, it is able to actually even run on mobile platforms. In fact, TensorFlow, they have this kind of problem where they keep coming up with new extensions to do things. They have like two different light versions of TensorFlow to run on mobile devices in the form of TensorFlow Mobile and TensorFlow Lite. They developed TensorBoard, which is this honestly amazing debugging and like visualization platform. So basically, you can visualize the entirety of your deep net inside this visualization tool. You can follow gradients as it propagates through the network and can monitor your training progress to see the loss functions and like the actual output of the nets as it's learning to do whatever your task is. Um, it has TensorFlow serving, which is useful for prod deployments. It's only Python, but basically it's a kind of easy one-step drop-in solution for you take your model, you throw it in there, and it exposes a REST API. So you can easily hit and get the results from your model with very little coding to get it up. And there is a lot of documentation from Google, which is actually pretty good documentation for Google, and also a lot of third-party documentation just because of how popular it is in the community. It's used by companies like Uber, Airbnb, and Dropbox. It's mainly a symbolic paradigm language, but it recently gained support for, for dynamic paradigm definitions in TensorFlow 2.0, I think. Um, other things, it has very, very deep Google Cloud integration. So if you're ever on the actual Google Cloud platform and you want to deploy your model, it's pretty easy to do it with, with TensorFlow. One negative is that it's a fairly low level library to work with. So if you're actually going to be writing and defining networks in TensorFlow, you're going to be doing a lot of kind of low level repetitive things, defining a lot of hyperparameters that you don't want to deal with. But things like Keras, like I said before, solve this problem. And also like Sonnet is another library that I'll go over later. Um, one other negative is most of the APIs outside of the core C and Python library are experimental in Google's own words, or they're mainly supported through third-party open source projects. So do it that way you will. If you want to rely on their Java API, it exists, but it shows you how much they will actually focus on it. Um, but probably the biggest issue with TensorFlow is its performance. TensorFlow, in its design with Google, with all of its like infinite resources and hardware isn't really that efficient compared to the other options. It tends to be a resource hog in terms of like memory when you actually launch it. Other libs can be like twice as fast as TensorFlow in certain deep net tasks. You probably really want to avoid it for like recurrent neural networks or LSTMs because there are much better options. I mean, you would use it just because of the community out there, but Really, that it's not that great scaling efficiency. And I mean, there are plenty of good reasons to use TensorFlow, and I'm not trying to convince people not to use TensorFlow if they already use it, but this is probably the only negative, and they are actively working on it. They always say that, but there's always kind of like this race of all the deep learning libraries trying to be faster than each other and slowly making improvements as they go. And TensorFlow has always just kind of been behind the pack a bit. So the next library that most people think of when they're comparing to TensorFlow is going to be, yeah, question in the back? So on TensorFlow, can you talk about flow? Hmm. Is that on train or on Both. So TensorFlow tends to be slow in basically all of the computation that it has to do, and that tends to add up in terms of the training time. So if you're just doing inference on a pre-trained <coughs> net, it's still going to do that forward pass of the net with your input data is slower than most of the other libraries would. And at training time, if you have to do that millions of times as you go through all the iterations, it adds up over time. So like I said, if you have the money for the resources, it's not really a problem. But if you're constrained to your one machine with your one GPU, and if you want to prototype as fast as possible, it can be an issue. So PyTorch and Torch. So Torch was also one of the early academic focused libs with CAFE, but it <clears throat> kind of didn't catch on as much as CAFE did. It had a lot of maintainers that were at mainly NYU and ended up going to Facebook, 
when they graduated. Um, PyTorch and Torch are tied together in the sense that they use the same underlying C library, so they have very similar performance. But the main difference is they differ in their interface, where Torch uses Lua, which is part of the reason they didn't really catch on as much, and PyTorch uses Python. Another main advantage of PyTorch over Torch is that it has auto differentiation, ca auto dif differentiation capabilities, and it does both paradigms, whereas Torch only did the symbolic paradigm. As you can see, there are still more research citations in Torch just because there's a lot of earlier research in it, but, Torch, but PyTorch is catching up very fast, and honestly, currently, it's probably the most popular library in terms of the research community with recent research. So PyTorch was made with the goal of kind of fixing and modernizing Torch. It has a hybrid front end, so we can use both symbolic and dynamic paradigms when you're defining your networks, depending on what you're trying to do. <clears throat> it has its own visualization dashboard, similar to TensorBoard called Visdom, but there are also with TensorBoard forks that work with PyTorch if you're used to that environment and want to use it. It should probably be avoided if your end goal is a kind of production environment application. In fact, face uh, in, in, in fact, Facebook actually maintains, or well, used to maintain, a separate library for production purposes for doing deep learning called Cafe2, which we'll get to later. It was actually recently merged into PyTorch, so they kind of like combined all their work into one library finally. Um, they are slowly making changes to PyTorch to make it more production ready, but they're kind of diverged focus there. Kind of, it, they've fallen behind the other options when it comes to production level libraries. And but like I said before, researchers tend to prefer PyTorch over TensorFlow just because it makes prototyping really easy. It makes defining new layers really easy, especially if that's kind of the main area of your focus is defining like new structures or layers for your network or like loss functions that do specific things. Just Py, PyTorch and Torch were kind of like the first to try to push this dynamic paradigm of model defining and it kind of verily attracted a lot of attention because of it. And there's a lot of, like I said, usage because of it. So the next option, which is also new, but also growing fast, is MXNet. So this is basically Apache and Amazon's kind of attempt to enter the whole deep learning library area. Um, it has the largest officially supported API selection. So <coughs> as you can see up here, we have Scala, R, Python, C++, Julia, Clojure, JavaScript, Mat MATLAB, and Perl if you ever want to use Perl to do your deep learning work. Um, there is high compatibility and consistency through these libraries, uh, also, like sometimes to a fault. So for example, there, if you use one a a a API interface and you switch to another one, you're probably already going to know how to use it because all the calls are the same, all the structure is the same. But because of that, they, there's kind of some cross-contamination in design choices with the API. So for example, there's some Python coding patterns inside the Scala functional API, for example, that are kind of not the best to do, but that's how they did it. It is a direct competitor to TensorFlow pretty much across all applications. It can run on everything from a web browser to a mobile phone. It has massive distributed server farm capabilities. And the key advantage to MXNet is it ba basically its ability to scale in its performance. Amazon has shown, and they're trying to convince people that, I mean, it is true, that it can scale it, like up to 85% efficiency when you keep throwing, adding GPUs to, the, to your cluster, which is great. <clears throat> and also, generally, it's single GPU performance is also very good from most online benchmarks, comparing all of them. It has its own serving framework, similar to TensorFlow Serving, and it has deep integration with AWS. So if you're in the AWS environment and you want to do things like training on their SageMaker platform or like deploying to their own stuff, it makes it pretty easy. It has its own TensorBoard forks if you want to visualize your training process and get all that working well. Yes? Can you explain that 85% scaling efficiency? Yeah, so theoretically, scaling efficiency. So say you have one GPU and you want to add a second GPU to your server or cluster to speed up your training process. With 85% scaling efficiency, that means when you add a second GPU, you'll get a 85% speed increase as opposed to a 100% speed increase, which would be theoretically the limit of your potential speed increase by adding more resources to your cluster. So depending on how the underlying library works in terms of 
trading information between all of your available GPUs and like whether they're networked together or on the same machine. You can lose some efficiencies there. And basically, Amazon has found that they were the best in terms of scaling with up to 85% efficiency when you start adding GPUs in. So they have the minimal overhead. <clears throat> so MXNet also has a second Python interface along with their original interface called MXNet Gluon. It was created in a collaboration between AWS and Microsoft. <clears throat> it provides a more high level, clear, concise, and simple API for defining deep neural nets, whereas the raw MXNet API can be fairly low level like TensorFlow. It has a bunch of predefined layers and optimizers and an, an, uh, initializers for you to use. And it has its own built-in model zoo that's separate from the, MX, from the raw MXNet one that's actually better. It has hybridization, which is probably the best feature about it. So like PyTorch, it has a hybrid symbolic and dynamic graph uh, model for defining your networks. But you can actually gain the advantages of both at the same time. So you can, for example, define your entire network in the Gluon high, uh, dynamic uh, framework. And then say when you're done debugging, testing, and writing your code, you can just call dot hybridize on your entire net, and it'll go through on the back end and reconstruct the entire thing as a symbolic net. And then you gain all the advantages of speed and resource management without changing any of your code. In fact, you can actually even break it down so it only does that for parts of your network. So say you are working on a network and you know the first part of your feature extraction network is pretty typical and there's nothing really to work on there, but you're working on a new loss layer at the very end where you need to do some weird things. You can call hybridize on just the first part of that network, so it creates a um, symbolic network there so we can do all the optimizations, but then the very end of your network, it's still dynamic, so you can still drop in, do your break statements, do some weird logic flow around there. And because of this, Gluon can be up to three times as fast as PyTorch for doing similar dynamic work, because it can go on its own backend and do some optimizations symbolically when it can. It has great documentation for absolute beginners for Gluon. So basically, it's a pretty good online book that will walk you through like a lot of the math and the internals of Gluon, and kind of like walk you through creating things as simple as like linear regression models, with Gluon all the way up to like convolutional neural networks from scratch and LSTMs and to do things like classification, like object detection, a bunch of NLP problems. <laughs> Basically, you should always use Gluon over raw Python API if you're using MXNet, if you ever get the chance. So issues with MXNet, um, the non-Python APIs, yeah? So is, is Gluon a fork of MXNet? No, it's actually inside the MXNet like repository itself. There are two Python APIs hosted on their GitHub repo. So you can call the, the normal one's called the module API, which is what all the languages share. They all share the module API, but the Gluon API is only defined in Python and it's completely built from the ground up separately just to address a, bu a bunch of issues. Like the module API for all the other languages are only symbolic. So you can't do all the fancy di dynamic graph stuff and use the advantages of like the hybridization for all the layers. And like, a, and it generally, it's a fairly low-level API for all the other languages. So, yeah. So use the Gluon if you're using Python. Otherwise, if you're using something like R, or Julia, or Perl, then you have to use the module API. So, this advantage with MXNet, all the non-Python APIs are kind of lacking in certain aspects. The documentation is weaker. Um, the stability issues when you start throwing like full production scale load at it, it can fall apart a bit. The community is small, but it's still growing, um, but it's really never the first library to be used for like open source projects or like re-implementations of research papers. So if there's some cool thing that came out from like NIPS or something and you want to get using as fast as possible, but you don't really know how to implement yourself, you'll probably have to be waiting a while for someone to do it in MXNet because they'll probably do it in PyTorch or, t or TensorFlow first. <coughs> So next, we have CNTK, which is Microsoft's attempt at making a deep, a deep learning library. It stands for the Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit, which was originally created by MSR speech researchers to do NLP type problems. Recently, and up to this point, it has been expanded to do all types of deep learning applications, and it's kind of their own in-house deep learning library that they work with. 
It's used for things like Skype, Xbox, Cortana, basically anything Azure that they're pointing that they're like pushing out nowadays, like HoloLens or like Connect now is an Azure thing instead of an Xbox thing. Um, it has a main focus on NLP from the beginning, and because of that, it has honestly unbeatable RNN and like LSTM performance, just because of some design choices that they make in terms of how dynamically sized input and outputs are passed around between the layers that are kind of cumbersome to do in TensorFlow, but are just very easy to do and kind of expected in CNTK. It supports for distributed training like TensorFlow. In fact, they have a like proprietary one-bit stochastic gradient descent algorithm that actually significantly improves training performance when you're working on their hardware. And probably the biggest reason why people use it is that it's the only library with first-class Windows support because it's made by Microsoft. In fact, it doesn't even support OSX officially. It only supports Windows and Linux. It has very simple Azure deployment solutions. And if you're using a .NET language because you love C Sharp, this is the library for you. But of course, it also works with R and Python and C++, since Microsoft is fairly invested in all those languages as well. It has an average size model zoo, honestly, and it pretty good documentation, which is consistent with most other MSDN documentation type problems. I mean, there are better ones. It has a non-conventional open source license history, which is kind of expected with Microsoft. They've gotten better now. They push over like everything over to MIT, but like certain aspects of the library aren't open source, so it gets kind of a little weird if you're trying to get into your own production environment. It has a fairly small community, as you can see by the research citations. Like honestly, it is going to be the least used option in research. Generally, most of those citations are probably from MSR themselves. So, but there's also code examples on the right. It works, like I said, there's. It works as a Keras backend, so there's an example there to do both Python and R, and there's a standard Python example if you want to use the low-level library. So one other library to kind of keep track of while we're going through all these is Onyx. So Onyx stands for the Open Neural Net Exchange Format. Basically, it was created in collaboration with AWS, Facebook, and Microsoft, notably Google is absent. And it's a library that's used for transferring models in between different libraries with a standardized serialized format. So basically if you train in one, like, so like if you train in MXNet, you can load your model into Onyx and then spit it out into uh, PyTorch or CMTK if you want to, or it also supports a bunch of other libraries, including TensorFlow, just not officially from Google themselves, along with some other options that we'll get, get to. But it's a very useful tool and you should definitely use it if you have existing work that you want to transfer over to new libraries. So a performance, a, a performance comparison summary. So here is a pretty useful archive paper from 2017. So it's a little old, so things have changed, but it's very well done. It compares CNTK, Ten Torch, CAFE, MXNet, and TensorFlow. And it compares them all on CPUs, single GPUs, multiple GPUs, and it tests both synthetic and real data that you could possibly be working with. And it kind of covers all the standard uh, deep net architectures that we've gone over and just to see what performs best where. And kind of a quick paper summary just to kind of get an idea of like what the performance comparisons are between the libraries. So for single GPU tasks, CAFE, CNTK, and Torch all perform better than MXNet and TensorFlow on fully connected network tasks. MXNet has the best performance in terms of convolutional neural network tasks, especially when the size of those networks are growing and growing and growing with the deep network layers and also the size of your input. Whereas CAFE and CNTK also achieve good performance, but only on the smaller size of the CNNs you can work with. RNNs and LSTMs, like I said before, CNTK cannot be beat. It has almost five to 10 times faster speed than some of the other options at certain tasks. When working with multiple GPUs, like I said before, MXNet and Torch tend to scale the best with MXNet beating out Torch slightly. TensorFlow scales the worst. C CNTK performs better at scaling with fully connected networks than the other ones, but you generally won't ever be really working with fully, fully connected networks since more of a synthetic data task or if you're working with like vectorized inputs to try to do simple production on. Um, some of the libraries have library specific optimizations that others don't, especially when you're working with symbolic Defined graphs, so example, CNTK and MXNet both have the ability to optimize heavily the network at compile time to take advantage of the amount of memory you have and how much hardware resources you essentially have overall that it can take up. 
And overall, like I said before, the performance of TensorFlow tends to be trailing behind all the other options, which is really its only and biggest negative. So <clears throat> those are kind of the main ones, but those aren't the only options out there. And there are other libraries to probably take note of and are relevant if you care about them. So we have Theano, and this will kind of go about by quicker. So this is a Python library. It was also one of the early academic libraries. It has ended development. In fact, there was a pretty somber blog post from the developers when they decided to do this, where they're kind of bowing out of the competition between, at the time, uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow, saying that there really isn't a reason for them to keep working on it with these better options out there. So they decided to commit their own time to working on those libraries instead. Though, <clears throat> There was a lot of early research that was done in it. In fact, it is responsible for spawning off Keras and some other high-level deep learning libraries that are built on top of it. So it is a very important history. And you can still use Theano currently today with Keras. Here's some code examples. But really, you should never use it over TensorFlow unless you're specifically working with old code and you need to use it for a weird reason. You have Cafe2, which I mentioned before, which originally was the maintainer of CAFE graduated from Berkeley, went to Facebook to start working, and started working on CAFE 2 after he got there. And eventually, like I said, it got merged into PyTorch. CAFE 2 was designed from the beginning to focus on production applications. So it's very good at scaling from mobile devices all the way to multiple GPU farms. It improves over CAFE in a lot of areas. So it has auto differentiation, it has first class support for large scale distributed training, where CAFE was really only single computer solutions. It could do multiple computer solutions, but it's kind of not that great. <clears throat> it has better modern hardware support. It has a lot more flexibility in terms, of the, in terms of using things like quantized computation, which basically quantized computation is if you want to take your network and remove the floating point accuracy of the, in, the individual computations inside your network to gain speed for the trade-off of a bit of accuracy. And it has been stress tested by the vast scale of Facebook applications, and Facebook uses it internally for their own stuff. We have FastAI. So FastAI is a library that is built on top of PyTorch. FastAI's main goal is essentially to be a learning tool for people looking to get into research. It is a library that's focused on basically the best practices of doing deep learning. They offer a very good free online and yearly updated set of courses on their website. It'll teach you everything you need, that you need to know about deep learning. And you can even take an in-person course if you're in San Francisco this year. It's the first time that they're doing it. They're, they are probably the quickest at integrating new research kind of ideas and getting examples out from my experience. And it's, like I said, it's very good for beginners who are getting into research and want to kind of master the topic. This is where you want to start, because you'll get to know PyTorch very well after doing this. And FastAI kind of abstracts a lot of the PyTorch PyTorch stuff in the beginning and slowly introduces you into the lower end uh, library. You have Core ML. So <clears throat> this is Apple's a deep learning library. It's not a full deep learning library, really. It's completely closed sourced. And it, you can't do training in it. Really, it's only used for deploying previously trained models to Apple hardware, so like your iPhones or your MacBooks. You need to use a different deep learning library to train your model. And then they have their own provided tools to convert things from like KRS, CAFE, Scikit-Learn, LibSVM, XGBoost, MXNet, and TensorFlow into the Core ML format. And Core ML is also supported by Onyx, so you can pretty much get any model into a iPhone now. But this is really the best way to run your models on iOS hardware. So if that's your end production goal, this is really what you should look into. There are some other options, but they're not really that performant, where CoreML can use a lot of native advantages that Apple has. And it can be written in Swift and Objective-C, which is the only options for really running on iOS. We have the Deep Learning Toolbox by MATLAB. So it is a MATLAB toolbox for implementing CNNs and LSTMs. It has pretty good GPU support, and it can even do cloud GPUs on AWS with a separate toolbox that is the Distributive Computing Toolbox. It has a lot of nice visualizations and tools. You can create, visualize, analyze deep learning networks and their architecture and structure with their own interactive apps. It's very useful for training. They have their own model zoo. You can even load in models from Onyx and Cafe and TensorFlow directly with Toolbox. But with everything MATLAB, it's expensive. 
So it's closed source and you have to buy the toolbox from MATLAB in either a annual license for 500 bucks or a perpetual license for $1,200. So if you're in a lab and they're paying for your MATLAB license already because you're in a university, great, use this. It's probably not that bad of an experience to work with. But honestly, there is a bunch of open source and free Python and R options out there that you should probably use instead. But if all your code's already in MATLAB, here you go. There's an option for you. Deep Learning 4J, for people who don't know that there's a world outside of the JVM. Um, so it is written with the JVM in mind, so its target API languages are Scala and Java. Probably one day they'll get to Kotlin. It, it has native Keras support if you want to train in Python, but the end result is always going to be in Java. It is mainly focused on enterprise and getting things out into your JVM application. It takes advantage of a lot of distributed computing frameworks. So if you're working with Hadoop or Apache Spark, this is an option for you. MXNet also has integration with Apache Spark if you want to run deep learning on your Spark cluster. And you can also natively import models from TensorFlow. And I think Cafe as well. But it has pretty good performance, very good documentation. And honestly, I think they deserve more usage than they actually get just because they're very niche in their application. But it's a very good library. Chainer. Um, not much to say about Chainer. It is a library from a Japanese startup that was fairly early on. It got some research usage early on when people were using it. It was one of the first libraries to have a dynamic graph computation interface like PyTorch did. Apparently, it's used by IBM and Intel for some things. Really isn't a lot of a reason to use Chainer over any of the other options. I mean, if you need a Japanese documentation for it, maybe that's why. But outside of it, I would skip it. Darknet. Um, Darknet is a very small open source effort by a very laid back dev group. So basically, it is a project by a group out of the University of Washington, I think, where it's basically really more of an exercise by the lab itself to create their own deep learning library so they can do everything and know how everything works. Um, they're like, it's a very laid back. The entire repo is filled with emojis. All of their PRs are kind of ridiculous. But it's used in some of their own research that is notable. And probably one key thing is that the main maintainer of this repo has written my favorite research paper ever. It's hilarious, and everybody should read it if you get the chance. Sonnet. So Sonnet is the other library built on top of TensorFlow that I mentioned before. It is similar to Keras in that it's really to make using TensorFlow easier. But this one is developed by Google DeepMind. It, which is one of the, probably the biggest names in the AI industry research. They are behind things like AlphaGo, which is the first AI to beat a professional Go player. They are behind AlphaStar, which is the first AI to beat a, I don't know if it was the first one, but a notable AI to beat a professional StarCraft player in real time. Really, like I said, it's built on TensorFlow. It makes neural net construction and training easy and extensible. It's really just the DeepMind guys making their own library because they know what they want to do and they want to do it their way. You can use it yourself. There isn't a lot of use in it. I mean, there's some publication research, but it's all out of DeepMind. So if you really want to work with DeepMind or get into DeepMind, probably start using this. Uh, Knet.jl. This is a Julia-only deep learning library if you love Julia and want to use it. Basically, the only reason you'd use this is if you want to use kind of the expressiveness of Julia in your model definitions, so like things like helper functions, conditionals, recursions, and closures. Um, that's about it. It has pretty good performance, not as good as the other options, but if you are a Julia developer and you want to get to deep learning, here's an option for you. Uh, Paddle. So Paddle stands for the Parallel Distributed Deep Learning Package. It is made by Baidu. It has a, per, it has a mainly Chinese documentation that has been <laughs> translated into English. It was originally developed by Baidu for their own in-house AI application. So like Baidu is essentially the Google of China. So all of their own applications use this for the machine learning tasks on their back end. Really, you would only use this if you are in that market or ecosystem already and are familiar with, I guess, how they do things. So for most, probably most of this room, this is an option that you could probably ignore. Covnet.js. So this is a library for doing deep neural training deep neural net training in your browser, if that's something you'd ever want to do. It's mainly used for like teaching purposes, so it's very helpful for like visualizing and the training process of your neural net in browsers. Basically, it was created by Stanford for their, deep, for their machine learning class to help teach people. 
you can actually start training a network by just clicking that link, and it'll start training in your browser a CFAIR uh, classification network. Um, really, that's about it. I would also advise taking the Stanford class if you're trying to learn. It's a very useful tool. They provide all the notes and all the lecture videos and all the homework that you can do it yourself. Uh, Neon. So Neon is Intel's attempt at making a deep, a deep learning library. It is written with specific. It was written after they acquired a company called Nirvana, and is written specifically with MKL, which is their uh, linear algebra library hardware in mind. So your Xeon and your and you, if you've ever seen those Phi computation boards that Intel makes that are kind of like GPUs but not GPUs, but you still plug them into your computer the same way, uh, processors. Really, it's the only reason why you would use Neon is if you have one of those Phi processes or you're really trying to get the best speed out of your Xeon server. Um, it has one of the best performances out there because that's always been the main focus of this library in development is speed. They were one of the first libraries to do like half floating point precision calculation or even quantization on their training process. But yeah, it's interesting, but I've never used it and I probably won't and it's only a Python library, so. Dynet. This is the last one that's probably taken note of. It's by Stanford. I mean, it's by, it's by, it's by Carnegie Mellon. It's used for some of their research. Eh, not much to say about it. It uses dynamic computation graph, and that's why it's named that. So basically a TLDR. So if you're looking to do most things, you could probably go with TensorFlow. It's especially for like industry and like production related things. If you care more about your speed, you're a good developer, like you're willing to deal with some of the bugs or like figuring out some things that most community won't be able to help you with, look into MXNet and Gluon because you'll definitely gain some things there, especially if you're using one of the non-standard API languages that MXNet supports over TensorFlow. Uh, use PyTorch if you're doing research. That is probably the easiest uh, suggestion there. If you're just getting started and you want to get started as fast as possible, look into Keras. If you're getting started but you want to learn as much as possible, look into FastAI. If you're in the world of Windows and Visual Studio and .NET, look into CNTK, especially if you're doing NLP. But don't do CNTK if you're specifically only doing NLP. The other options are also good as well, just not as fast. Use CoreML for deploying Apple devices and use Deep Learning for J if you really like the JVM. And just to help it out a bit more, I've created this nice flow chart that you can help <laughs> decide what deep, deep net learning library is best for you. I don't know if you can read it back there, but I will publish this later in a way that you can look in yourself. So yeah, that's it. So. I guess if we have time for questions or yeah, something. We have time for about, you know, roughly five to 10 questions. We'll okay. them on the arc. So the first one's right here, perfect. I have two questions, actually. Uh, one is that you mentioned half precision floating point. Is that like a code 16 in Python? Yes. So most, so, so especially with CUDA devices on your GPU, most things are done in 32-bit floating point accuracy or even 64-bit if you want to do double precision. Right. Switching to half precision, you lose some accuracy, but you gain a lot of speed since it simplifies the underlying mathematical computation that the GPU has to do, okay. which for most things, if you're not like doing like very specific like astronomical level, Calculations is not that important. Right. And then with TensorFlow, was it TensorFlow late in mobile like folded into the same project like maybe a year ago? That might be the case. I haven't honestly kept up with it since the last time I looked into it, so yeah. So yeah, it's like specific cases for that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, curious about H2O. Did you mention that one? Um, I'm not. I have seen it. I'm not familiar with it really, so I can't really talk much about it. Um, if it hasn't jumped out to me for a reason, I'd, it's probably a reason for that, but I don't know. I'm not going to throw the mic at you so you can come <laughs> here or can I get a run? Would you mind running this back to me? Thanks. <laughs> I'm curious. Um, as you went through the assessment and evaluation, Different libraries will always give different results just because of the underlying way they do the calculations. I wouldn't never say that one library leads to more accurate code in the end, since that more has to do with the specific implementations that the writer of your models or your algorithms 
chooses to do, like maybe some libraries make it easier to do certain things and that changes your code. But really the main difference would less be accuracy and more be speed is the main thing to worry about in terms of your models. So which one did you choose? Oh yeah, so I never said that. So after this entire process, we ended up going, so originally we were using CAFE for a few years and it was kind of a pain. We started early using CAFE just because that's what the models we were using were originally trained with. Um, we ended up maintaining our own interface for CAFE, which is a real pain because all of our production code is in Scala in JVM. Um, so we wrote our own C++ to Scala API for CAFE, maintained it internally, and all that was a pain to all the binary stuff you have to maintain for that. So after doing all this, we ended up going with MXNet over TensorFlow. Those were the last two options we were kind of definitely comparing against back and forth, mainly just because the big thing was that MXNet supports Scala directly, whereas for TensorFlow, we would have had to go through the Java API, which is not that great compared to the Scala API in MXNet. And all of our tech stack is actually in AWS already, so we have a pretty good relation with the AWS AI team, which maintains their brand, their part of MXNet, so there's a little bit bias there, but. Yeah, so the question was if there's any significant difference from loading one model from one library to another. Um, depending on how complicated the model can be, you might actually run into issues where you get completely different outputs, depending on how good the conversion uh, software is. So if you're doing more simple kind of like CNNs, all the libraries are pretty standardized on how to do that, so you're going to get like identical networks on the other side. Uh, Performance-wise, having certain models defined in a certain way on one library that's more efficient for that, library probably won't be efficient for the other libraries, so you will, will lose some performance there. Um, so honestly, in my experience, when it comes to transferring models from one library to another, I have more often than not just retrain the entire model. And just if I already have the uh, code and framework set up to do it, I'll just rewrite the training code in the other library and just set it off for the weekend and come back and look at it. And I'll get similar performance, but it's yeah, that is an option. That's, that's, that's not always an option, especially if you're like, looking at types of models that like ImageNet where it takes like weeks to train. You never want to do that again. Um, but yeah, so generally, assuming you have a pretty basic and not like custom model framework, it should be similar performance. It might not always be the same just because of some un underlying things, but it would never be drastically wrong. With the TensorFlow being Um, so the thing with Keras as a backend, it, the main advantage is that it does give you all those options. So if you're, but you really lose the performance advantages when you're using Keras because, like I said earlier, it can't construct the underlying graph in a efficient way for the underlying library, even though it is only symbolic. It still has to translate all of its interpretation of the network into all of the other underlying frameworks interpretation, and it's never going to be the most efficient. So if you're ever looking at benchmarks that compare like Keras TensorFlow to just raw TensorFlow, it's always faster on TensorFlow. And it's the same story for like CNTK and MXNet and uh, Piano when you're using it as backends. Um, but yeah, the main advantage is, is that you can switch. Assuming that all of the layers and operations that you're trying to do in Keras are supported in Keras. But like I said before, sometimes you do have to go down into the native library to do some things if you're getting more advanced, and then you lose the advantage there of being abstracted away from the lower level library. Yeah, so if you're doing something like just simple CNNs, you will get faster performance out of the MXNet backend than the TensorFlow backend. Oh, like all the time, so. I think you mentioned that TensorFlow works pretty well with Google Cloud. Um, uh, do you have any recommendation in terms of like if we use like AWS or Azure or other like you know, do certain libraries work better with Amazon or with Microsoft or with Yeah. So 
for a for for AWS, the answer is MXNet, just because it's the library that they themselves maintain. So things like if you've ever used SageMaker, which is their kind of cloud training platform, their branch of MXNet on SageMaker runs faster than all the other libraries because it's directly accelerated for their hardware. In fact, Amazon offers custom um, tensor inference hardware called Elastic called Elastic Inference Accelerators that work with MXNet natively. And also there's a branch of TensorFlow that they maintain themselves to enable it, but it's not as maintained as the MXNet version, which is a cheaper way to train on the cloud as opposed to using a GPU. Google off also offers something very similar with their TPUs and TensorFlow on Google Cloud. So that's the reason to use TensorFlow on Google Cloud. As for Azure, like I said before, CNTK is Microsoft's own version and that works easily the best with Azure, especially if you're working with like .NET stuff and deploying on there. So generally, you're not going to go wrong with the owner of the cloud service's own platform. The only other cloud service you're going to run into outside of those three is going to be like IBM or HP. And IBM does, I guess, use Chainer, but don't use that. Just probably use TensorFlow if you're on IBM Cloud. <laughs> yeah, uh, the Rocker project just launched a bunch of uh, experimental GPU-enabled uh, development images for, uh, and we have an MXNet and TensorFlow right now. Mm -hmm. um, if there are other things people want thrown in, we can talk about it. Uh, but my question is, um, why are RNNs and NLP so different? So the main thing has to do with the structure of the net. So for a convolutional neural net, you can fix the entire size of the net. So you have a standard image size, be like 256 by 256 is your input, and that structure of the net's never going to change. I mean, it can change with fully, convolut fully convolutional neural nets, which is a, a kind of an offshoot of convolutional neural nets where there are no fully connected layers in it whatsoever, so it can actually change in size since every operation is a kernel. But for RNNs and LSTMs, when they're feeding into themselves, the output of each layer of, of each iteration is never going to be the same in terms of size. So it has to kind of readapt itself. And especially with LSTMs, it does some very crazy things with gates on the inside for like the memory management that are, are never the same between one iteration of the net to the next one as it goes through the entire time series. So especially with that kind of looping logic and everything, it's a lot more n natural to use it in a dynamic paradigm that is your PyTorches of the world than it is to try to force it into, like I said, like CAFE, it's possible to do RNNs with. It's a weird hack to get it working. <laughs> All of the modern libraries can do all the RNN type problems. It's just some do it better than others from just underlying design choices when they were making the library. So for your CNTKs of the world, that was their main focus going from the beginning. So a lot of like the low level, just like things like padding your outputs from like one to another in, C in like CNTK is much easier to deal with than a TensorFlow, which is kind of a pain. Whereas like PyTorch is somewhere in the middle. Um, and yeah, so it's possible to do like Google on MXNet has an entire NLP library to work with. You can do almost everything in it. It's just, it's, it is abstracted away from you. So most of the time you don't have to worry about that kind of a thing, but you're going to lose performance and that's just kind of the main trade-off. Cool. So thank you very much, Jesse, for giving this wonderful talk.